your pricing model is directly tied with your customer acquisition model in a product-led company. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Dude, what's up? Oh, I'm coming across. Oh, Wes, how you doing, man? Good, thanks. The man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Product-Led Growth. We got yep. Wes Bush. Um, when did the book come out? May 28th. Okay, this year. cool. So congrats on the, uh, the growth of that. Um, what is product-led growth? Yeah, so I feel like product-led growth, a lot of people hear it nowadays, like, oh, this is something completely new and revolutionary. And I'm like, no, this has been around for a long time. Now it's just coming to the software space. If you think about buying a t-shirt, especially me, like I'm tall, I'm weird, like size, I wanna try on a shirt, see if it's a good fit, try before I buy. If you even think of cologne or perfume, you wanna try this before you buy it, see if it's a good fit. And now product-led growth, a lot of people are realizing you can do the same same thing with software. And whenever you buy software, you want to get a taste test of what this is like. And so I feel like product-led growth is really taking off because right now it's, it's so easy to whip up a value prop on your website, throw it on there and promise someone the world, but can you deliver? Yeah. And so that's really why people are starting to realize like free trial free models, they make sense because they build trust so much quicker than the alternative of going through a long sales cycle. Is so, there is there a category of business type? Pro Let's say B2B SaaS is my world. Yep. Uh, are there certain types of products that make more sense? Is it annual contract value, customer segments, or do you think this works even for like, you know, enterprise medical software for hospitals? Like where, where's the, obviously SMB, it's made a lot of sense for many years, but for sure. where's the spectrum of companies? How should they, what, what would they, what would need to be true about their, their product or their, their sales motion for them to feel like this is something I got to look into? Yeah, definitely. So like it's really predominant in the SMB space because it's been prehistorically like really hard to make that work in well, any other model. It's expensive if you have to pay. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, but if you go up to enterprise, one of the, the most common myths that there is around product-led growth is you can't get a high annual contract value if you use a product-led model. And so that's actually not true. Like there's Lucid Charts, have you heard of them? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, so they close really massive deals and they start off with maybe like just- six, six, seven, seven figures? Yeah. Okay. And so they start off with users just starting to use their product, they like it, and then on their end, they can see, oh, great, this Fortune 500 company has 500 people already using our software. Let's actually start that uh, sales motion now. And so the, the way they approach sales is definitely different, but it's really just focusing in on, okay, now that these people are using the product, we've qualified them, they like the value. Now let's help them get even more value out of our solution for maybe even some of our other products. So uh, how, how much of it is the trial concept versus freemium? land and expand, you know, product qualified leads. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff we can unpack, but okay, mm -hmm. let's start with, um, you know, is this freemium or is trial still considered product led growth? Is this, oh, okay. Good question. Like, do you have to do freemium to do this? So no, you just need to let people into the product. Yeah, you need to let people into the product so okay. they can see if it's a good fit for themselves. Okay. And so whether it's free trial for me and both of them are product led. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of how you really um, treat it. So for instance, I would actually argue you could have a free trial and not be product led. I've seen this in a ton of companies where they'll have a free trial and what do they do? They treat it just like a sales demo. Yeah. And so the An expensive someone's, lead magnet. It's, it's yeah. a little bit more inexpensive than a demo. Yeah. And so they'll just have that person sign up, they'll call them up, go through the traditional sales process, and it's, it's awful. It's like a faux free. It's <laughs> yeah. not real. Because yeah. it's like the person expects to evaluate the product in this one method, which is, okay, I want to try it on my own and get up to speed. But then they're going through this like traditional sales motion. And so um, a lot of those companies, they, they haven't actually thought about okay, when someone signs up for the free trial, how can we get them to value? They think it's like, okay, they just want to uh, go around the product and then hop on a call with us. That's not true. People want to actually see if they can experience the value that you're promising on your website. And if they do and they're successful using that product, then they're a lot more likely to upgrade. How, how do you do that if you have a product that is... Um, 
uh, requires data configuration, et cetera. Like I know some, some, some people listening are like, yeah, but that might be nice if I have like a simple like email marketing tool, but Mm -hmm. you know, my tool is like this, this, you know, really complex, you know, workflow cause like it requires work to actually trial it. What is, what are your thoughts on, on solving that for them? So even really complex products, you can break it down. So in any product, there's three questions you need to ask yourself. So the first one is like, okay, what are those steps that just get in the way of our users? Eliminate those. And then what are those advanced steps? So are we like showing people advanced features that maybe it's the first time using the product? It's like, they don't need to see that. Mm-hmm. They just need to get to that first quick win. And then the other and last question is, what are the actual essential steps here? And so what I do is I, I usually go through with people and say, okay, let's find all those essential steps. And that's essentially building a straight line onboarding experience. So there's sign up and then there's first value. And how can we get that journey as short as possible? So even if you think of like products that you don't get immediate value, like maybe it's Hotjar, Google Analytics, or Drift, Intercom. Mm. So all these products are useless unless you do one step, which is you have to put a script on your website. Yeah. If you don't do that, there, there's no use in these products. And so it's like identifying, okay, what is the quick win? One, once people do that, then what can we get them to do next? Maybe if it's Hotjar, it's actually seeing how people use your product and are on your website. So there's so much more you can do once you like nail down, like what are those quick wins? How can we get people to those as soon as possible? So even the big companies, you still think there's steps to get them? Yeah. <laughs> and when you say first value, um, what does that mean for you? First value, it can mean many things for some companies. Like if you're talking about those really simple products uh, like Facebook or something like that, that might be like adding those first seven friends and you have a reason to come back. Or if you're signing up for Quora, that might be actually following 10 topics or upvoting your first votes um, or first posts. And then that way you can actually have a reason or they have a reason to contact you again and be like, here's all this relevant content based on Mm -hmm. what you showed us. And it's the perfect trigger to continue that journey. And so whenever I think of first value, I just like to think of, okay, what is the the thing that is likely to bring this person back? Because there's an epidemic in SaaS. I don't know if you know the stat, but 40 to 60% of people who sign up for your product are just not coming back after that first time. No matter what. No matter what. Okay. And so it's like, okay, if o- almost half of these people are not going to come back what can we do to bring them back? So that first five minutes is the most important place you could ever focus on your funnel because that relationship starts and ends there for a lot of people. And so if you can start it off on the right foot and have a reason for people to come back, then it's going to be really smooth sailing for you. Where'd you learn all this stuff? Me? Yeah. I learned it through doing all the shit wrong. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's your story like? Um, I know you worked at Vidyard, um, yeah. Demand Gen. You know, we've talked in the past, he said, like, you know, you love demand gen. Yeah. Um, like, what's the what's the uh, the body of work that you kind of are pulling from? Yeah. So how I got into product led growth really started with like demand gen. And so uh, it was working actually with my parents they are both real estate agents. They have their own company. And so I got able to use like Google AdWords very early on. And when it was first coming out and whenever I I did that, I I started generating customers for them. And whenever I saw the first customer close, I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. If you can build demand, you can build any kind of business. And so that's what really got me hooked. And so from that point on, I started working on like other B2B SaaS companies, whether it's in digital marketing, demand gen, and really just trying to hone the skill of, okay, how do you build demand? And I, at that time, like whether it was even just like the the traditional inbound marketing approach, I I tried that where you're creating the content, putting behind guides, and then sending those people a bunch of content and emails until one day, hopefully they They convert. Exactly. And so I found that that model for these B2B SaaS companies was just really expensive. And then I started to to look at the way I was buying. And I wasn't actually kind of signing up for these these white papers and going through to the end, clicking the sign up button for the product, and then going through the demo process. I was more inclined to actually just go ahead, go to the website, sign up for it, and try it out on my own. If I liked it, I would buy it. And that's how it worked. And so it wasn't until I was actually at Vidyard and we launched, I viewed it, which is now just 
as part of their main product, which is a, a Chrome extension where you can kind of record your screen and see, uh, or like send it to someone else so you can see, okay, who actually watched this video and get some cool analytics on it. So when we launched that, it went to over 100,000 users really quickly. And so I started to realize, like, wait a minute. <laughs> the way you do demand gen has really changed. It's not so much about, hey, like, here's the guides. You can read about our product and how we do our approach and then sign up. It's more like the ultimate lead magnet is your product. product. Yeah. And that is the best lead magnet ever because you're, you're shortening that journey of the buyer and you're saying, all right, you have this problem, here's the solution and try it for yourself. And if you can make sure that you can deliver on that value as soon as possible, people are gonna be like, I have a problem, now I have a solution, I am done my evaluation phase, I am great with this solution because I now have solved my problem and that journey is incredible for so many people because it's so quick and you can help people in a is huge there, way. Is there, um, so most people are doing a sales led model, right? Sales motion where they have yep. demos and you got to get on a call and they qualify you and they, you know, here's all these white papers. Um, is it in parallel with that? I mean, are there still, you know, it's not like you can circumvent that and that, that does not require cause there isn't a kind of like an appropriate buying experience, you know, quoting Lincoln mm -hmm. Murphy. Um, that they're expecting in regards to a, a negotiation potentially, or you know maybe something more involved. H how do you um, introduce this without like you know what I mean? If you already have mm -hmm. a sales team, like how do you do these things in parallel? Yeah, you know, do you have data that supports that this is a better process in regards to you know ROI and metrics? Like how do you, how do you how would you make that argument for somebody? It's like, hey man, I love this, but it sounds mm -hmm. like really dangerous for me to try this if I want to hit my numbers. Yeah, it can be dangerous. And especially at the bigger scale, you're going to try and make this work. Um, that's really hard. And I've seen it work for some companies, but they have to have the, the exec team on board with this big shift. Mm -hmm. And a lot it of It is time, a big shift, though. Yeah. Because I know you've worked with companies that are like 500K to 5 million in ARR. Yeah. Um, to make this decision, the exec team needs to be absolutely. This isn't like, hey, let's create an ebook. This is yeah. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna change a lot. Yeah, I wish it was as simple as let's just create this ebook and let's uh, let's get this out yeah. into the world. But you're totally right. So there there's a lot of things where a lot of people will think, wait, this is such a big shift, and they kind of get. Uh, frozen in terms of like, okay, I don't think we can do this. Um, and that's, it's good to think it through. <laughs> I'm not all for like, let's just jump on this. And then you start seeing like, all right, this free trial is cannibalizing all our demos and everything else like that. So um, the thing is, you just have to start small. And what most people don't realize is nowadays, it's so easy to run simple tests. So for instance, if you wanted to test running a free trial, well, there's A-B testing solutions. Like let's show it to 2% of our entire website traffic. Great, Just great start. suggestion, yes. And then it's like you can have one person dedicated when someone requests a trial. I'm not even saying you have to get the free trial, the whole touchless onboarding. Just request that free trial. And then you can talk to someone and be like, we're gonna walk you through the product and show you how to use it. And sometimes in those first interviews, when you're kind of onboarding people, you're gonna realize that, you know, you might think something super easy in your product, and then the person just like rolling their eyes and be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like this is brutal. And that's when you start to learn, like how could we make this completely automated. And so it's not like this one and done, like we're a free trial product led company today. It's like, just start somewhere. Maybe it's with that 2% of your website traffic. If you're a really big, you know, $500 million company, that might be like way too much. Maybe it's 1%. Yeah. Uh, if you're, you're smaller, it might be 50%. Who knows what's your perfect kind of so you can work there. your way into that funnel. Exactly. Got it. And then as you're like going through those interviews with people and onboarding them one by one, you're going to learn like, okay, there are some like $10 tasks here that we're doing that could totally be eliminated. Maybe that is uh, making the process of signing up for people easier so the developers can then, you know, make it easier for people to get their passwords for their accounts. So you don't have to do that. And so you can scale it up and just figure out, okay, what are the places we can automate this and go from there? So what's interesting is, um, you know, Litz, Michael Litt from Vidyar is a good friend of mine. Yep. Um, and I saw him launch, viewed it, and we were talking about it. He's like, you know, one of the problems we need to solve is the cost of demand gen is, is getting crazy. And mm -hmm. we, we have this thesis, and if we build this thing, we'll increase the top of funnel. Sure, we'll have people that may never be a, a Vidyar customer. That's, that's totally fine if we can mm -hmm. keep our cogs, you know, cost of 
or cost of goods sold. Um, do you recommend, or what are your thoughts on doing like a splintering of your core product to a freemium micro app tool? Like, or is that a good way to experiment? You know, I, I mean, fresh, mm-hmm. you know, Mike from FreshBooks was on recently and yeah. you know, I didn't bring it up, but I remember when they like launched a mobile app in, I think it was in Canada under a different brand yeah. to test. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts on doing that versus just the split testing on the core traffic to not yeah. confuse the market? So I think it really depends on like what kind of company you have. So if you have multi-product, like in Vidyard's case, it was multi-product. If in HubSpot's case, it was multi-product too, whenever they did their the free greater. sales tool. Yep. And so if you have that multi-product approach, it's a great way to test it out, build that internal team and kind of vet that idea and process within your own team without you know, really killing the cash cow potentially if this goes wrong. And so in terms of risk diversification, it's amazing. That's, that's how I would recommend it if you have a multi-product company. Mm-hmm. But in FreshBooks case, they were dealing with a very old product. And so whenever they did that new kind of competitor that they had on the sideline, that was a brilliant idea because I have seen it in the other case where, for instance, you're working with the main team on the core product and it is just everyone's thinking about how do we we monetize in the the old way, the way we have done it in the past. And so it's baggage and it means you'll move slower. And so I think what the FreshBooks team did to really introduce that new version was really brilliant because you could have that kind of skunkworks team working on your in your company, but they're really your competitor. And if you look at any business that has stayed around for a long time, I know a perfect example is like HP. HP has been around a long time, but the way they've done it is they built products that cannibalize their current market share. And I so mean, this is Netflix, Apple, yeah. et cetera. I mean, exactly. Yeah. And so that's how they have built a generational company is you have to eat your own company. And so I think that's the best way is you got to introduce your own competitor. Don't wait for somebody else to go freemium or free trial. Exactly. Be the first one to jump there. For sure. Um, Because I mean, I I, I guess in the MarTech space, there's just so many examples of like really expensive email marketing tools and then MailChimp goes freemium, you know, but they still offer these really powerful things or, you know, even on the video side. Um, In your book, you mentioned uh, in a conversation that I think eight, like there's a bunch of chapters, but one chapter is like 80% of the book. What, what do you cover in that chapter Yeah, that, that makes it so meaty and that people seem to really gravitate towards? Yeah. So chapter 13, the, uh, the, and the title of your book, just product yeah, pl- plug it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the author product led growth, go buy it. And chapter 13, what do you yeah. cover? So it's all about how to turn your users into happy paying customers. So that's really the the crux of product-led growth because if the model's right for you and you want to really make it work for you, you have to figure out this one big problem, which is, all right, like you can have that free trial for your model. That's that's really not the hard part. Um, anyone can, can get that up and set it fairly quickly. But the hard part is how do we figure out how to actually um, get this user to a point in their life, not necessarily in your products, where they say, this is the product I really need to solve my problems. And so a lot of people think, okay, it's if someone signs up for my product, I want to help them become the expert at the product. Now that sounds great, but that's not the goal of onboarding. It's actually, how can I get you to uh, experience something incredible in your life? For instance, let's say- I think I saw a um, graphic on your blog where it was like the Mario Brothers. Yes. Yeah, it was like Mario <laughs> plus the mushroom, your product. This is what they're actually after. Exactly. Like the, the success as a service, I sometimes call SaaS, right? Yeah, so Samuel Hollock came up with that. And I think it's brilliant because you have, for anyone that doesn't know Mario, like you can run over a specific flower and the flower makes you twice as big and you can spew fireballs from your mouth and kill all the bad guys and it's incredible. And you look at that extra sized Mario who's super powerful. It's like, that's what we want people to do or feel whenever they're using our product. But the product, what people is, is like, that's the flower, that's the power up. And so that's not what we're really selling. It's like that, we wanna sell that super sized Mario that makes them feel like this hero. And so even if it's like the take it down to the B2B SaaS world, let's say I sign up for a business intelligence tool. Well, I mean, the tool's great and everything, but what we're really selling is someone actually has insight into their business, they can actually make really incredible decisions based on this. Maybe if they're presenting it to their board, um, they can look like a pro. Maybe they're not even a designer, but like they look like one. They did an incredible job. So there's in a ton of inherent value in that that's outside of the product. So that's really whenever you're thinking of 
good onboarding and how to turn those users into paying customers. That's what we want to go for. It's, it's not necessarily like, yeah, get good at clicking around in our tool. Got it. Yeah. And so when you said um, first value, that's not enough. First value is a step. Well, I, and and yeah. if you've ever heard the aha moment, I call it core value, value switch. I mean, they're all saying the same, same thing. Yeah, same so thing. different words, same outcomes, but you're saying that's not enough to get somebody feeling like this powered up Mario. We need, we need to do more. What are those other things? So the other things, like for that first value, sometimes it is enough. So some tools, very few though, especially in the B2B SaaS world, you can sign up and see immediate value. Like usually you'll see very this in the few. B2C space where yeah. let's say it's Netflix and I sign up and immediately I'm just amazed. I'm like, wow, the selection, there, play, there's so watch. much stuff yeah. here. You it's lose like, three hours of your life. Yeah. You're like, this is amazing. <laughs> exactly. Nine so there's bucks a month. <laughs> quick time to value. But in B2B SaaS, it's really the case. You usually sign up, you see a dashboard that's empty. You're like, oh, I've got to do something. And there's this one analogy that I love. It's from the uh, CPO of Grow.com, where a lot of B2B SaaS companies, they, they promise people, like, let's say they'll advertise, get hot and ready spaghetti for $5. And it's like, then people come to your restaurant, they sit down, and then the, the waiter comes up to them, they're like, hey, wait a minute, you got to go to the kitchen and make this stuff. <laughs> and like, that's really what SaaS is like. It's like, wow. oh, yeah, here's the, the tools in the kitchen and everything else you need, um, because you got to make it yourself. And so there's that expectation in and a lot of times, that's really what I was talking about, the perceived value is like, a lot of times we promise people like the world to like get your problem solved in 60 seconds. And it's like, wait a minute, you do a lot of making lifting. spaghetti takes longer than 60 seconds. <laughs> and so we have to really get better at setting that expectation, really um, making it easier for people to make that spaghetti on their own. So they could potentially pull off the 60 second spaghetti if you prepped a lot of stuff, gave them templates, had the, yeah. you know what I mean? Like exactly. if you think of like a conveyor, it's like, yeah, you know, so it's interesting how if you think about that for your product, you know, it doesn't matter if it's like, you know, there's a lot of um, trends in the industry around like management type tools, you know, one on ones, um, Aiden from fellow uh, somebody I'll be interviewing soon. And, uh, you know, there's work to be done there. But if you make it easy on me, you can deliver on the value prop, which is, you know, become a 10x manager. But exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I like I like that. Um, thought process um, in regards to the skill set because like and it's, it's interesting because you know I've, I've got a clip of Patrick Campbell from Price Intelligence me tell him telling me to he said fuck you Dan <laughs> um, he's the nicest guy in the world like Patrick yeah, is, is pretty much an honorary Canadian um, <laughs> because we, we were fighting over freemium right because yeah. he's like he's pro freemium and I'm, it's not that I'm not, but I just think that people don't know how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, especially for the early founders, I'm always concerned that they don't have the skill set from a product point of view. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, fine. it's, it's ugly. It's, it's, it's your, 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 your like a pimply teenager. Like it <laughs> does it, you know, like in the early days you kind of are selling the vision mm -hmm. and you, you're working really hard in the office to get it to catch up to what you sell. Yeah. So if you let somebody in, they would be underwhelmed, rightfully mm -hmm. so, because you're, you're one sure. guy, maybe 1.5 guys building this thing. Yeah. Um, what are the skill sets that, that you know, earlier stage founders need to get at least good enough at to do this right? Support. Like Unpack that. All product-led companies, the one common element I've seen them really hone in on is they are always understanding or talking to their customers. And so even if you look at Ahrefs, one thing I love about the marketing team is they also- They what, 50 million in AR? Uh, last time I talked to them last year was 40, but they could be there. I think they're even further, but yeah. and like, it's hilarious because I think they don't even like don't do analytics on their marketing. Like they're oh, just really? <laughs> no, like they're not, uh, they've bragged of like, we don't really know. We just, it may, it's just a product, I guess. Yeah. And like their marketing team, they each of them spends one day doing support. And even in some of the companies that are making the big transition to be more product led, one thing I've seen them do that I think is brilliant is they will essentially spend, like they have one user researcher, they just book a bunch of meetings for these interviews and they'll invite everyone on the team to participate listen. and yeah. just listen. And I think it's so important in any product led business to have that access to the customer and make it easy for people. And so that's the biggest thing I, I think any founder needs to have is just like that ear to the ground. But as you grow 
and you get bigger, it gets harder. And that's why I'm saying like some of those items, like having that user researcher just so you can participate or listen to those conversations. It's such a great way to get a feel for, okay, are we building the right product to solve these problems? Because it's not about, okay, let's just launch these features, but who are we helping and how are we going to help them with that problem that they're struggling with? Mm. What companies do you, other companies that you look at that inspire you around the way they lead product and, and look at product led growth? So I think one of the ones that I think has done a pretty good job making that switch is RD Station in Brazil. And so they're a 750 person company and at that scale, it's really hard <laughs> to make that transition from sales led to product led. And so they have done an incredible job really just even splitting up their sales team from, you know, we, they kept the, the high touch sales team, but then they also introduced more of a low touch sales team for the smaller S and B market. So I think there's a lot of ways you can slice and dice it to make it work for you, but making that transition at such a big stage is really hard. And so I have like huge respect for anyone that can pull that off. At that stage. And what is, is there anything different when you've seen the lower touch sales teams? Like, cause I, I remember, I think I was listening to, uh, the woman who leads, um, sales either. At, I think it was Slack and she's like, yeah, our, our SMB team, like they they don't even have a quota. Mm -hmm. Like they're essentially there to facilitate the customer experience. Yeah and answer questions and configure and, and just help. And technically they're, they're part of SMB sales. Yeah. Is that something that you think is, is kind of part of this? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it is. Uh, it goes by many names. There's concierge, like uh, Zendesk calls it their advocacy team and like Zendesk themselves, like they didn't have a sales team until they went over 10,000 customers. Wow. And it was just their advocacy team. So their whole goal was just make your trial users successful. And that's all they focused on. And so there's, yeah, that, that, whether it's low touch sales, is that if that's what you want to call it, advocacy, concierge, that's really, it's all the same stuff. Mm. And what do you think is the risk? Like if people don't go down this path, do you think that for every market out there, somebody may introduce a trial or freemium solution equivalent to the enterprise version of it? Yeah, absolutely. So the big risk right now is there's there's two big waves coming that are kind of tacking on to this product led wave. So the first one is that people are not as willing to pay as much for the software that they they paid maybe five years ago. So it's the actually willingness to pay is coming down thirty percent in the last five years. Wow. So that's gone down thirty percent. And then on the other hand, we have customer acquisition costs has gone up fifty five percent in five years. So either you're getting squeezed, your profit margins just got slashed, or you're trying to think of, hey, how could we we approach this in a new way where maybe our customer acquisition costs aren't quite as high. So if you use a product led model, one of the benefits is it's a lot more efficient. And so if you can lower your customer acquisition costs and I mean willingness to pay, you can't really change that too much unless you introduce some revolutionary features and enter maybe a new market and create a new category. And that's hard. And so for a lot of the customers, especially if they're in more of a competitive space or red ocean, they have to really ask themselves, hey, like, how are we going to tackle this customer acquisition cost problem? Because it keeps going up every year. Either your margins get slashed or you try and think, how can we be more product led? So why is it, I'm, and again, I'm, I ask this is everybody listening, I'm not like, I ask the questions that I kind of know, but it's just <laughs> like, I know that people are thinking these things. Yeah. Um, why is it cheaper, you know, in regards to, you know, like I got to invest in engineering. I now have mm -hmm. people in my product, like I've got to support them. Is it cheaper? Is there a benefit to it? Is there a word of mouth component to it? Like, how does this help get more top of funnel? So it's kind of obvious why it's cheaper in a lot of ways. So let's say you book a demo. All right. How much are you paying that SDR? Mm -hmm. Just take a guess. Uh, yeah. Average SDR is between 80 and 120 a year. Yeah. And so you're paying that and that might take, you know, an hour and they're going to qualify maybe 10 people before they get someone that's like, all right, let's pass them on to the account executive. They're a perfect fit. And then you're paying that account executive. And how much are you paying that account executive? Oh, geez, 120 to 200 a year, you know? Yeah. And so out of that amount, maybe 
let's say once again, we have a good close rate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one in 10 is going to close. And so by that point, you might have already spent over a thousand, two thousand $2,000 in that sales process alone Easily. just to qualify that person. And so that's expensive, especially at scale. Whereas with a free trial, a freemium model, how much does it cost you to really get that person to sign up? and experience the product. And How then much? it's it that's where you you're hearing more of the PQLs, the product qualified exactly. leads come from, which is you get to qualify them based on the data, the, the activity in the product, yeah, the organization that they're with, you know, maybe there's other teams inside like now all of a sudden that SDR for sure is being done. Yeah. It's almost like you're putting some of the work on the customer to self-identify. Sure. You absolutely are. And so I remember really early on when I was talking to the Dave from Drift when he was there. Mm -hmm. So he was really just their whole product qualified lead model was, okay, we want to reach out to people who have had 100 conversations on their website. Because that person has actually seen the value of Drift. They get it. And they had 20 to 30% close rates whenever they would reach out to those people. And so it was really just using the product as, yeah, that qualification lever. And it really helped them identify, okay, this person knows the value, they're a good fit, let's reach out at this point. And it was a much better use of that salesperson's time. And to be honest, not everyone even had to reach out to sales. There was places in the products where it was so easy to upgrade. And so a lot of people don't think about that as like, how can we actually just oh, in the product- Oh, and then there's no AE involved. Oh yeah, you can totally cut that whole process out, especially for a lot of SMBs. So it's interesting because, um, it also acts as a forcing function to make the product better, Definitely. which might sound crazy to people listening, but like a lot of, I think, mid market enterprise customers spend a lot of time on like adding features to mm -hmm. solve problems for these big guys. But if you just look at like the funnel, you know, it's a lot, the, the bottom of the funnel is going to get better if we can get double the top of the funnel conversion to the secondary stage. Right. Definitely. And, and, and that'll mean the product gets better because we need to get them in and activated, which means everybody else gets to win because even if I sell somebody that never used the product, when mm -hmm. they come in, they'll have a more Definitely. positive experience. Yeah, and, and it's something a lot of companies don't think about where even just the whole process of, okay, maybe they've even had a free trial freemium model, but then they don't have any upgrade button. And they're like, what's going on here? And like the big thing, and one of the reasons why, is a lot of people don't think about this, but your pricing model is directly tied with your customer acquisition model in a product-led company. It's kind of like this arranged marriage in a lot of ways, because let's say for your pricing model, we just jack up the price. Well, okay, now no one really wants to sign up for the super expensive product that they might have to pay for. For instance, with a customer acquisition model, let's say we go all in on freemium, we give everything away for free. I mean, our customer acquisition model is gonna go way up, but maybe that's just users that are signing up. They're not actually customers. And so your pricing takes a hit. So you always have to balance Balance. Like, what is that perfect balance there? And one of the things, even when you're talking to uh, Patrick Campbell that he advocates and I advocate for too, is finding that value metric. Like, how do you charge for your service? If your email marketing solution, maybe it's per subscriber that you're charging for. If we sell shoes, it's per pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to understand your pricing because you want to make it easy for people to upgrade on their own. And a lot of B2B SaaS companies, they have this very complicated way that they sell their product and to be product led, you need to make that process easy so that someone can go to your pricing page or maybe on an upgrade page in your product and in and five seconds, it. figure out what it's going to cost them. They get it. So you're saying yeah. pricing is part of product led growth. Absolutely. You have to have that under control and really hone it to a point where it's really easy for your users to understand, not just you. Hmm. Yeah. You know, as an investor in intercom, I know that's always been in the early days, I'm not saying yeah. today, even though a lot of people, I think I just saw this like email go to a bunch of users where they're like raising the prices again. <laughs> yes. And I mean, it's just, but uh, uh, like, you know, this is, mm -hmm. this is everybody says they don't want to do it at scale. Like you mm -hmm. need to capture value. You need to experiment some, you know, I think Patrick says, if you're not testing your pricing kind of like, you know, twice a year, then a lot, a lot of people listen to yeah. this. You haven't raised your prices, right? Definitely. It's like one of the first things you should probably do. Like tomorrow, go go test it out. Um, where do you think this this um, you know the SaaS market's going? If it's getting more expensive to acquire, the willingness to pay is going down. Um, you know how how do companies continue to grow if all their you know 
Like what's, what's the next evolution? Is there, even on the customer support side, is there ways that you're seeing companies able to scale support in a way that's still great, but more scalable or is it human to human? Cause it's, it, it seems like a lot of people, you know, on the back end on the support side, if you have that many more users. Yeah. So what's happening in the SaaS space is that every industry, I don't care what it is, is getting commoditized so much quicker. Because nowadays, even Hacker Noon states this, you can start a SaaS company for zero dollars. And that doesn't mean you can grow one for zero dollars, but the barrier to entry is low. It's never been lower than it was today. Yeah. And so because it's been so easy to create a SaaS company, it just means the competition level is going getting fierce. And so if you really want to build a moat for your business, you need to think product led and really how can we create that mode? Maybe it's giving away a lot of these features for free as kind of the, the gateway drug to your product and the main product that you sell. And so I really think that um, it is going to be imperative for people to think about, okay, how can we give away more for free to really stand out and build that mode for our business? And I think that's actually going to be a really big competitive differentiator. Raise the free line. It's interesting. I remember, um, even on the content, uh, I had Mike McDermott from FreshBooks on, and he said, because uh, I asked him, I was like, why are you so into giving and speaking at events and stuff? Mm-hmm. And he said, well, and he, I think he quoted the guys from 37 Signals, and he said, we could either outspend or we can outteach, mm-hmm. right? And it's almost like, you know, we can outsell or we can outgive. Yeah. That's, it sounds like that's what you're saying. It's like if we yeah. can if we can give more of the product without requiring, you know, payment and or conversation and just as much as we can do that that and it's interesting because what you see online it's it's never been easier to say like what's the cheapest tool to do this and it's like (laughs) you know 55 you know facebook comments later Mm -hmm. um but i mean free is (laughs) free is a good answer especially if you have good support you have a great product that gets people activated they they get to that first value so this is really a strategic like direction that all companies in the future are going to have to go yeah, I mean, like free has always been the most powerful word in marketing. You see free, your your eyes are raised or look in that direction. Like, hey, yeah. how can I get access to that free resource? Yeah, is it really free? And now? so it's yeah. always been that case. It's just now it's a little bit easier to make it work for your business. And if you think about it in terms of even how Alaskan looks at their support bugs, they're looking at that as like, this is a, a bug. Like, let's solve it. Someone had to reach out to us to get a problem solved. Why? And most companies don't ask that last question, which is why are they reaching out? How can we solve that within our product so that people have no need? And so even the support costs of doing this for a freemium or a free trial can be significantly reduced. Oh, because all of a sudden approach. you're saying, hey, we've been doing this for them or there's issues. How do we make it so that that's no longer an issue anymore so it doesn't even show up in support? Exactly. Interesting. Um, Wes, when you look at your journey, you know, over the last five years or, you know, you don't seem like a very old dude, but like how, wh- who have you had to become, you know, on a character set or just on a personal level to kind of be the guy that wrote the book that works with all these big companies and help them with this? Like, what are some of the things, you know, just on a personal level that you had to yeah. evolve to? Who do you need to become? So I think it's two things. The first one is... I guess before this, I was always one of those people who would say things like the whole entrepreneur and I would just say stuff and like, oh, I'm going to build one of these businesses one day. And like one of the reasons why I started my business is like, I'm done with that side of Wes. (laughs) Like I actually want to, whenever I say something, have that word mean something and take action. So I think if you're going to build any business or try and build any movement, you have to take action. You can't just be saying stuff. Uh, Although I'm saying stuff right now. But (laughs) yeah, but then you take action when you're right after. That's yes, it. So then the other part is think long term. And so whenever I started thinking, okay, do I want to double down on product led growth? I already had like the next three years of like, there's all these assets and fun things I want to do to build this category. And I can see myself doing this for a decade. And I think that's to me, the exciting part is I think long term and I have no intentions of just like taking the shortcut. So for me, that's the, the big thing I think you need to think about if you're wanting to create any category. It's like, it's not just, you know, a quick win. Like <laughs> there's better ways there's to make money. There's a lot easier ways to make money. <laughs> than building a category. So I think for me, just think long term. That's interesting. So take action, not just talk about it. Mm-hmm. I like the decade view. It gives you enough of time. It's not too far in the future, but it yeah. it uh, asks, it gives a good felt, like a gut check of like, 
would I be willing to be in this category for the next 10 years? Yeah, absolutely. And not just kind of a, a fad. Um, man, I love meeting people like yourself, Wes. You reached out a while ago to ask me to be part of your summit, um, and that was a lot of fun. And seeing you kind of continue to put out content, speak at events, um, push this conversation forward is really cool. And I just wanted to let you know how much I appreciate it. And I'm um, looking forward to the next decade of you you know, teaching everything you know. So thanks again, man. Appreciate awesome. it. Thanks so much. Cool. That's a wrap. Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.